Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, this is actually our third webinar uh, this month. Uh, the month of March, we have a webinar series and we're focusing on our collaborative community. Um, so we have a great webinar planned for you today and we're so glad you can join us. Um, today we have a panelist. We have three current students that are gonna talk to you about their journey, what it's like to be in our program, um, what it's like uh, to be a part of the community, the resources that they use, some of their challenges, advice, you name it. But they're here to really tell you their story and what it's like to be in our program. Um, I forgot to introduce myself, which I almost always do. My name is Jackie Panto. I am the Associate Director of Admissions at Penn Engineering. And um, again, I'm, I'm happy to welcome you all today. In addition to our three student panelists, um, we also have Tracy Stodel with us today, and Tracy is our senior academic advisor, um, and she is going to be here to give you uh, particular details about all of the resources that our students have. She'll talk about how to get involved if you want to get involved with the community, um, and just kind of give you lots of tips to the trade, all, all little tricks and, and, and tips um, about what it is to be a student here at Penn Engineering. So before we get started, what I wanted to do is to just give you a few housekeeping, housekeeping tips about the webinar. First, we are being recorded, so there's no need to take notes um, after the webinar. If there's some things that you forgot or you thought we said, you certainly can go back and you can watch the recording. You can share it with friends. And um, you're also gonna notice that we have lots of webinars um, that are available to you past webinars. So they're a great resource as you're trying to learn about our programs, learn about our community, learn about our resources. Um, past webinars are also great um, to view uh, to, to get all your questions answered. If you have questions during today's webinar, we are going to have a Q&A se se session at the end of the webinar. Um, our panelists will be answering questions, but we want you to also type your questions in the Q&A function. So find the Q&A function on your Zoom screen and you can type your question in and we have three members of the admissions team that's behind the scenes, and they are ready to type out answers. Uh, so hopefully we're going to answer everybody's questions uh, within the hour that we have today uh, for this webinar. So before I turn it over to Tracy and our panelists, I just wanted to go over a few things with you. Um, and the first thing is I wanted to talk about what makes the Penn Online degree so different and, and really what we think better than the other uh, online degrees that are out there. So first off, um, it's our faculty. Um, you are gonna have the opportunity to study with world-renowned faculty. Um, our faculty are not only excellent um, educators, they are also a top in their fields as researchers. So you will have the opportunity to work with the same faculty members that teach in our on-campus program. So that's really an important point to remember. In addition to our, our incredible faculty, our online program, Although it is structured, it is extremely flexible. It's flexible in the, from the standpoint of there's no synchronized courses. Everything is asynchronized. Our, um, all of our lectures are pre-recorded. There's an opportunity to meet with uh, folks virtually. You can meet with professors during office hours, which Tracy is gonna talk about, um, or you can meet with TAs, but there's nothing required from a synchronous standpoint. So you have the opportunity to study on your own time. In terms of your schedule, even creating your schedule is flexible. If you just want to want to take one course a semester, that's fine. If you want to take two or three, that's great. If you want to take one course in the fall semester and two or three in the spring semester, that's fine too. You can design a schedule that meets your needs, that fits into your particular lifestyle. And then the fourth point, um, which I think is um, probably the best point, about why the Penn degree um, is, is such a great degree and is because of our community. We have an amazing, robust, collaborative community. And that's what you're gonna hear today um, from our panelists and from Tracy. Um, you really have the opportunity um, to get to know and get involved, not only just with fellow students, but you have the opportunity to work with our faculty, to meet with them during office hours, um, to work with our staff, to work with our course team. So lots of different um, ways to get involved in the community, um, lots of different ways to feel a part of a community. And this is really not an isolating program. We give you many resources um, to be part of the community. 
And I really think that's such a great point of difference with our program. So the first program I just wanted to quickly go over is our MCIT online program. This is really, <clears throat> excuse me, an, a, a unique and one of a kind program because it provides the opportunity to, um, to, to get a, basically get a computer science degree without a computer science undergraduate degree. You do not need any computer science background whatsoever to apply and be accepted to this program. Most of our students have no computer science background to very little computer science background. Um, in fact, if you look at the bachelor's degrees that our students have, it could be anything, a wide variety, liberal arts, business, um, architects, nurses, musicians, you name it. So really um, is a great mix of folks that are have all different types of backgrounds, bachelor's degrees, and from the different industries that they work in. Um, the other thing to consider, it is the same degree, the same knowledge is conferred as a, as a traditional computer science degree. So you are getting the same type of coursework and the same knowledge is conferred. Um, the other thing to consider is that you graduate with the same diploma, the same transcript as our on-campus students. So you would be a graduate of the Master's of Computer and Information Technology program. There's no mention of an online on the diploma uh, on the transcript, on the degree. So you are a student of University of Pennsylvania. Our MSCDS online program, that program is actually designed for individuals who do have some computer science background. So they either have an undergraduate degree in computer science, or they have at least four computer science courses, four credit courses on their transcript. Um, we've given you some examples of those courses here on the screen. Um, but those are really the main ways. Um, that's the background that we're looking for for these programs. The third criteria or background we would be looking for are individuals who come from a highly quantitative undergraduate degree, say a math degree or some sort of a, a STEM engineering degree. Um, plus, they have two years of work experience as a data scientist or software engineer or some other um, field that requires um, coding and, and a lot of heavy quantitative work. So those are the three areas of criteria for our MSEDS program. So the MSEDS program is really um, taking a deep dive. After you have that computer science and that quantitative knowledge, it's really taking a deep dive and, and, and going further into the area of data science. So it's kind of like um, uh, even a, a next step after the, the MCIT program. What I wanted to do now is just to spend a little bit of time um, talking to you about our application details. Not sure, everybody might be at a different uh, point in the application. Maybe some of you haven't started the application yet. Um, maybe you have started and you're just trying to finish it up and you're looking for some pointers. Um, but here is uh, all, basically all of the information about our application. Um, obviously it is um, a, a, a very easy, uh, very turnkey. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen all of the elements that you need to submit the application. You need a resume, personal statement, all unofficial college transcripts from every college that you've attended. So if you've taken a course and you have a grade for it, we need that transcript. Um, there is a $90 application fee, and then you're going to give information for recommenders. Um, then those recommenders will upload a letter of recommendation, recommendation which will get attached directly to your application. The GRE is optional, and the TOEFL is only applicable for those um, applicants who are not U.S. citizens or they're not U.S. permanent residents, and if they did not graduate from a university where English was the primary language, okay? Um, in terms of dates and deadlines, the early deadline already passed. That was March 1st. So our next deadline is our regular application deadline, which is May 15th. So you still have about a uh, little less than two months uh, to get the applications in, but you can see all of our important dates and deadlines on the right-hand side of the screen. If you've submitted your application, you can go onto your status page and you can check the status of your application. So at any point in time, you can see if your recommenders have submitted their letter of recommendation, or if you intend to submit a GRE or a GMAT score, you can see if those scores were submitted by checking your status page or a TOEFL. If you need to provide your TOEFL score, you can go onto that status page 
and you can see if your TOEFL scores um, were, were uploaded to your application. So it really is a turnkey application. Um, it makes it easy for you to submit and it makes it easy for you to follow along um, to see if those elements um, have been attached to your application, the letters of recommendation, tests and test scores, okay? So I think I've very quickly um, covered some information. Hopefully I've given you a, a good background on what the degree um, is all about and the application elements. And I just wanna turn it over to Tracy uh, so that she can go through some great details and then introduce our panelists to you. So Tracy, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Yeah, hi y'all. I'm so happy to be here. Again, my name is Tracy Stoidel. I'm one of the senior academic advisors here at Penn Engineering Online. And I'm so excited to tell you more about the resources, ways to get involved, student support, after I go through these next few slides to explain those things, um, then we'll dive into that student panel. I promise to help answer those questions. So let's get into it. So what are some of the resources Penn Engineering Online students can access? What can you expect? Um, so you will find career services here. This will be career fairs, resume workshops, review sessions um, for your resume, internship and job searching. We have something called Handshake to help find jobs and to help find internships. You have access to that. And also you will have access to one-on-one -on -one counseling with a career advisor just as you figure out your next career steps. It's an incredibly valuable tool and that team is absolutely wonderful. We also have libraries. This is not just a campus resource. We do have virtual pen libraries with a plethora of accessible academic journals or, or anything that you might need. You also have a librarian um, specific for our programs and you are welcome to come to campus, get a photo ID, come through to the physical libraries, but just know that is not required or necessary. You do have access to virtual libraries. We also have um, alumni services. You have access to alumni services after you graduate, different alumni networking events. I just went to my first alumni networking event in Seattle. And let me tell you, it was popping. The food went so fast. It was very well attended. Um, so it's a great place to make connections as you are an alumni of Penn Engineering. Um, you also have access to something called My Pen, kind of similar to like a LinkedIn, but specifically just for Pen alum, um, where Pen alum will provide more information about their major um, and the areas that they focused on in school at Penn and when they graduated, so you can connect. Um, we also keep in very close contact with our alumni, our career services team, as well as our academics and student success team. And if you actually wanted to learn a little bit more what it's like to be an alumni, um, the panel next week will actually be focusing on some alumni students. So check that out for sure. We also have centers for people of similar backgrounds and they hold events together. Again, this is not just an on-campus resource. Um, these can all be accessed virtually. Um, so for this, I mean different cultural centers like the LGBT Center, the Women's Center, the Black Cultural Center. We have the Pan-Asian American Community House. We have the Center for Hispanic Excellence. All of these can be accessed virtually to find community. We do have federal financial aid and scholarship opportunities. I think I saw a few of those questions that our staff can help answer. So online students are eligible for federal financial aid so long as you're taking two CUs, which is usually two classes. Uh, we do also have something called the Dean's Master Scholarship, and we also have scholarships that you can find outside of Penn, outside of our network. But the Dean's Master Scholarship um, is something you can apply for at the time of admission. If you have any more questions about that, I'm sure someone can um, send the link or, or help out here in some way, but we have information of that on our website. And like Jackie mentioned, our robust online community, it's something we're extremely pr proud of. So on the next slide, let me dive into that a little bit more of what that looks like. Because for those of you who are in attendance, you might be wondering, how do you get connected with other students if you're not physically in a classroom or maybe you're not even in the same country? Um, so we have many ways to do this. Um, we know our students want to connect with one another and we provide all of the avenues in order for you to connect with one another. So what does that look like? We have something called the MCIT Online Student Association. That's called MOSA. And they host different professional and academic opportunities for MCIT students. Um, they host social events, they'll have coffee chats, hackathons, things like that. Um, for folks in the room who are like, wait, but I'm interested in MSCDS, where's my student organization? Have no fear. As this program continues to grow, we're definitely thinking about what a student association could look like. 
different events. I just mentioned that alumni event that I went to, but we have networking events for current students. We have things like Fall Fest, where students and alumni can actually get together. They come together in the fall and it's kind of like a conference style, but also networking event. Um, we've had it two times the past two years, and it's just been such a hit. Hundreds of people come from all over, come to campus who are in MCIT online and MSCDS online, get together, come to some sessions. Um, we we'll also have like a tailgate for a football game, get some tours of campus. We all go out to dinner together. It's really such a blast. If you're looking for some in-person in -person connections, it's also great so you can meet faculty, your TAs, it's wonderful. Uh, we also have road trips as well from the Career Services Office. I just wanted to highlight that just because I just got back from a road trip with the Career Services Office where we road tripped out to Seattle, like I mentioned, and we went on a bunch of site visits um, to connect with Penn alumni who work there and then bring current students to go connect and network with those folks, sit on panels, get tours of the spaces. We went and saw Meadow, we saw Amazon, we saw Stripe, and we saw the Expedia group. And it was, again, such a blast if you're looking for those in-person connections. Um, but we're an online program. So the online connections are something we also really want to provide for our students. So we have plenty of online virtual events. These could be career related. These could sometimes be policy related events like advising events. Also, whenever we introduce new courses, we'll have the faculty host a virtual event to explain that course. We just had a virtual event where we had one of our faculty members do a round table panel about artificial intelligence ethics. Um, so you'll see regular um, virtual events consistently. We also have different workspaces for folks to connect in real time. Slack is probably our most popular platform, been called the lifeblood of our program, our Slack workspace, because it really is the best way to just connect in real time with fellow students. So students in there will create different groups based on the programs that they're in, course planning advice. Hey, I'm trying to take these two classes. Has anyone taken these two classes before? So you'll, you'll very likely get like five to 10 replies. Oh, I took those two classes. They were fantastic. Or you might want to consider taking this class with this class because I did that and it was amazing. Um, you'll see tons of support. We even have a support channel. We have a pets channel if you want to post your pet. Um, we also have channels where people will post where they live. And for example, they'll say like, I'm a pen engineering online student who lives in New York City. So we'll have like a pen engineering online New York City group. Everyone gets together and maybe they'll they'll go out for a happy hour of sorts. I know um, a bunch of students realized they all lived in Budapest and now they all just got, went and got coffee in Budapest together because they all met on Slack and realized that they all live in the same place. So it's really wonderful. I do also want to highlight LinkedIn, great place for just career networking. As always, we do have LinkedIn spaces for our current students. And we also have something called Ed Discussion Boards. That is a forum to connect more so with students in your class and with TAs or instructors. So I do actually want to get a little bit more into that on the next slide here about the course experience and how you're supported in that. So this right here explains a little bit more about the course experience and how you are supported in your classes. We do have a big team of folks who help us. They keep the courses running smoothly and really give all of the support that you could possibly need. They maintain the Canvas platform, which is our learning management system that we use. Um, you might've heard of Blackboard before, um, similar to that, um, but we use Canvas here. Um, they also schedule live office hours, recitations throughout all times of the day so they can accommodate schedules and time zones. Um, they'll work with you with any tech issues if you're submitting assignment or anything like that, and they'll help you troubleshoot always. And again, they're very accommodating with different times of the day, and there's also help and support over the weekends. They also work with the student success team, like folks like myself, to let us know if we see any students struggling in their classes or missing a few assignments in a row. So we can reach out and we can support you and we can offer resources to see what's going on and we can start um, helping you out. So if you're hearing all of this and thinking to yourself, you know, this is such great support. This is awesome. How could I get involved? This is maybe something I've done before. Here is how you could actually get involved on the student support side, if that's something that's interesting to you. So we have teaching assistants, which you might have seen before in previous programs. So these are current students who have taken the course before. They host office hours. They host recitation. This is your course support. Um, now, we did talk with TAs last week, Jackie has told me, so in our previous webinars. So if you did actually want to learn a bit 
more about what it's like to be a TA and the TA experience, go ahead and watch that recording from last week from our similar student panel. We also have something called the Teaching and Learning Practicum, or we call it TLP. Um, this is not for credit courses for students, and this is how you could get involved, get teaching experience. You can attend seminars and webinars of professionals who have teaching experience just to brush up on those skills or learn those skills, and you can take this class multiple times. Taking a pause to take a drink of water for a second. I'm from New Jersey, so I talk really fast, so I apologize. All right, we keep on going. Then we also have academic coaches. Academic coaches are students, um, they're somewhere between like a mentor and a tutor, I would say. They're current students who actually work with incoming MCIT online students in their introductory classes. They really help you navigate your first semester. They'll hold information sessions. They'll meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. They'll talk with you about your coursework and that can help you with just resources and getting support and even job advice. So that is my spiel about all of the different support, community, ways to get involved that we have to offer. Why you're all here is because we want to meet the students on our panel. Let's hear it from them. And let's get started on that portion of this webinar so we can learn a little bit more about the students we have. So this is our student panel here. So I would love for you to meet Zachary, Ivy, and Quan. These are three MCIT online students. You can learn a little bit more about them on this slide here, but actually I'm gonna kick off this panel with our first question that we have for everyone, which is to tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your undergraduate degree? Are you working? What else do you do besides MCIT online? So really just telling us a little bit more about yourself to introduce yourself to the group. So I'm going to kick it off uh, with you, Zachary. If you can go ahead and unmute, tell us a little bit about yourself, undergraduate degree. Are you working right now? And what else do you do besides MCIT online? Sorry, that's a loaded, long intro question. So if you need me to repeat, let me know. Yeah, if I miss something, please let me know. Uh, my name is Zachary Blam. Um, this is my second semester in MCIT. Uh, my undergrad was physics and math, and I also have a master's degree in education. I was a high school math teacher before joining the program, and I'm using the program to make a career change. Um, I am not currently working. I'm full-time student, although I'm just doing two courses, but I'm also a TLP, so um, I'm assisting with one course, and that offers me a uh, a stipend that covers the costs of one class. And so I can expect I'll continue to do that and get the degree at half the cost, which is a, a great point for the degree, I think. Wonderful. Thank you. You answered all of the questions. So thank great. you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ivy, I'm going to toss it over to you next. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What was your undergraduate degree? Are you working right now? What else do you do besides MCIT online? Yeah, okay, so my name is Ivy, and I have my undergraduate degree in English, and I also have a master's degree in East Asian Studies, so that was all in humanities, and I'm currently actually working as a Chinese language instructor at University of Chicago, uh, besides taking MCIT online program, so I do work full-time, and I'm studying part-time. Yeah, Thanks, that's it. Ivy. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for introducing yourself. And now I'm going to toss it over to you, Quan. I will repeat the question one more time again, because it's a little multifaceted. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Quan, your undergraduate degree. Are you working? What else do you do besides MCIT online? Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Hey, everyone. My name is Quan. I'm, my undergrad degree was in finance. And then after that, I spent a few years working across finance strategy operations at different tech startups. Right now I'm working full-time at a healthcare organization that's based here in New York City. And I'm also a part-time student. So outside of school and working, which is not much free time, but that's kind of the, the special part of, or that's kind of the journey that we all commit to as part of this program. Um, yeah, I just, Try to catch up with family or friends when they're in town or just trying to live healthily. Thanks for sharing that. I love that you highlighted what you do outside of work and school too. All right. The next question that I have for everyone on the panel is 
from what we've just learned about you, you all come from a variety of different backgrounds. So what did you do to prepare yourself for the program, especially in terms of your quantitative experience for MCIT online? That's the most common question we get. Um, so how about I actually, I'll start out with Ivy on this one. Um, so how did you prepare yourself to apply for your, your program, especially in terms of your quantitative experience for MCIT online? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Cause I said like earlier that I was coming from, you know, come from like a totally non-STEM background. So I did a lot to prepare for the application. I took the GRE test. And I also took an online discrete math course offered, I guess, by um, UC San Diego Extension School that's online. And I also took one online Python programming course to prepare for like programming, especially um, Python. And I, I've also took like two Coursera courses offered by Penn Engineering. One is the computational thinking for problem solving. And one is the introduction to Java and object oriented programming, the two courses. I guess like the two courses definitely helps me a lot to evaluate my quantitative skills and also helps me to prepare for the core courses offered by MCIT online program. So I guess I, I did a lot of preparation and I finally got enrolled in the program. So I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Ivy. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing all that. All right, Quan, I'm going to have you answer this question next. Since you come from a variety of backgrounds, what did you do to prepare yourself to apply for your program, especially in terms of your quantitative experience from CIT Online? Yeah, of course. So I did not take the GRE, but I did take um, several courses that were offered by Penn on Coursera. So I also, like Ivy, I took the computational thinking for problem solving, which I thought was a great introduction to programming and just the high level thinking. And then also did the specialization um, on Python, Java, on Coursera as well, which is a group of four courses. And I thought it was also great, not only introducing the fundamentals of computer science and programming in Python, Java, but also kind of give me a sense of how content and materials are delivered by the Penn staff. Um, so I thought those resources were really nice to have, and they're free to, of course. Thank you so much. All right, Zachary, and now I'm going to toss this question over to you. What did you do to prepare yourself for your program, especially in terms of your quantitative experience for MCIT online? Yeah, so um, I was pretty confident in my math background since I had a math degree. And um, when I did my master's in education, I had a break between my undergrad and that program. And so at that time, I had been successful going back to math. So I thought I could do the same with this program. So my focus was mostly on coding, um, the Coursera courses that have also been mentioned. Um, and actually I did a um, an undergrad programming certificate from a online school, um, just because I didn't know which programs I'd be accepted into. And um, I was dedicated to the career change. So maybe that's a little bit of overkill, but I'm glad I did it because it prepared me well for the, the introductory uh, coding courses for Python and Java. So my focus was mostly on the coding rather than math because I was confident in my math background. Thank you, Zachary. And you actually have the next question that um, we have, which is um, what your favorite course was and why? And I think it was a little bit related to your answer to your previous question. Yeah, um, I'm in my second semester. So I've, I've completed two courses and I'm currently doing two courses. And out of those four, I wouldn't say I have a favorite, but I'd say all the courses have been very challenging and rigorous, and I'm I'm happy with that. I expected a rigorous program when I uh, decided to come to Penn. And I'd also say that it's been a good mix for me, the way I've paired the courses, because I've done one programming course and then one course that uh, a math course or uh, the 596, the algorithms course, which is not require programming. Uh, is a little bit more abstract. And so for me, this has been a nice mix because if I'm kind of getting tired of one or stuck on a problem with one, I can go to the other and kind of do some thinking in a different way. 
and then come back to the problem and and have a fresh perspective. So for me, the courses really complement each other, and and that's what I've enjoyed the most about the courses I've taken so far. Thanks for sharing, and I'll offer some more insight um, from the advising side. I actually haven't seen a very consistent favorite course from students. I think because our students come from such a variety of backgrounds, you find a diversity in what is people's favorite course, to be quite honest with you. I think some folks really, really enjoy some of the core courses and maybe more of the foundational. And then you find some students who really, really enjoy the elective courses because they're like, well, I got my foundations now, so I cannot wait to take AI. That's what I've been waiting for. Um, so you really see um, a lot of different favorite courses here. Um, so I like hearing the perspective that you brought, Zachary, of what your favorite courses are. So thank you so much for sharing. The yeah, next my pleasure. Yeah, thanks. And the next question I have is for everyone again. Um, a question for you, which is why did you choose the MCIT online program? And for this, I'm going to start out with Juan. Why did you choose the MCIT online program? So I think the biggest reason for me was just the reputation of the program. So at the time, or I think even now the online uh, program is new, but the MCIT on campus has been around for decades. And just doing a quick LinkedIn search of the alum, I could see how successful they are in the career shift. And I felt like that was a good evidence to how well the program is structured and the things that you learn do the program. And I feel like that's the case, just going to the program now, um, even being online, I'm learning a lot, I'm getting a lot of support. And yeah, just going back to your answer is just the um, um, the reputation program, which is true in that it does provide you all the support you need to succeed. I'm happy to hear that. And I think that we're, we're going to get into some of the student resources. I think that's a question that we have later on as well. But I'm happy to hear that was a big reason that led you to choose the MCIT online program. All right, I'm going to toss it over to you, Ivy. Why did you choose the MCIT online program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I chose like MCIT online program. Basically, I got, have two reasons. The first reason is that like this program offers, uh, you know, courses for students without a prior background in computer science or even in STEM like majors. So this is a key factor that draw me to MCI online program. I feel like this inclusive approach of the program ensures me that I can start this new learning with confidence. And then the second reason I chose MCIT program is because it's flexibility because I work full time. So I decided to choose like some of the online programs. And then I found the MCIT online from Google. And I found like, these all courses are pre-recorded and asynchronous. This aligns perfectly with my current working commitment. And then I can easily, you know, st split the study into different time periods, like one hour in the morning, like one hour at night and some longer time during the weekend. So I feel like by saving the commit ta commute time to take online program, it's act I'm actually taking advantage of that time to learn more. So I feel like that's also one of the major reasons I chose MC online program. And then besides all of that, so I trust, you know, UPenn. I feel like UPenn is the prestigious school. So I trust MC online's programs, quality of the courses, and also like the quality of faculty's teaching. And I feel like the career outlook for MC MCIT online program also, is also really good. So I decided to chose MC online program, MCIT online program, and I really love it for now. That makes me so happy to hear that you love it. And you brought up a few good points that I think I would like to add some more information about again from, from the advising side. You mentioned the flexibility of the program. I'm sure for a lot of people listening, that's likely why you're seeking an online program as well. So I want to reiterate that. So it is 
10 course units for our degree programs. And we have students in our famously known turtle club who will take one course at a time. We have turtles who will go one course at a time. Summers are optional. Um, so just our fall and spring, we love it. You can do that. We have some students who might take courses full-time, right? And take maybe more than two and take maybe three or four, like Zachary was mentioning. But you definitely don't have to. The flexibility is there. You can take one course in one semester, two in the next. Um, and that's what the advising team is really here for. When you're like, hey, how many courses should I be taking? We're here to offer advice of like, maybe start out with one course in your first semester. That's something we always recommend. And then maybe you start building up and you can add one or two courses as you go on. And I think folks really appreciate that flexibility a lot and it makes me really happy um and then you also were just mentioning like the actual course delivery um and i think i would like to touch upon that a little bit more too because a lot of you were mentioning the specialization courses and coursera so what what is the difference between the coursera courses and the courses that you're taking with pan engineering online um so the biggest difference is those coursera courses are moocs right so massive open online courses um, where you completely move at your own pace and you just pick up and do the course whenever you feel like it for our online courses there are assignments, there are due dates, there are um, projects, there are some team projects. I know, I think I saw one of those questions in the chat as well. So you'll find a lot of that. So I just wanted to highlight the difference there, why those MOOCs are still good prep for the online format and they're taught by Penn faculty as well, can really, really prepare you. But also once you hop into the program, just knowing there are deadlines, there are tests, there are midterms, there are projects, those things will happen. Sorry, that was a very long tag along. <laughs> but Zachary, I do want to ask you this question as well. I have not forgotten. So why did you choose the MCIT online program? Yeah, for some of the reasons that were already mentioned, you know, I didn't have a CS undergrad degree. So I was looking for a program that would allow me to earn a master's degree in CS without such a background as at the undergrad level. So that was a perfect fit with, with this program. Um, another big thing for me uh, was the cost of the degree. I thought it was reasonable. Um, I looked at a lot of different programs and some programs were more than double. And I just kind of couldn't believe that that would be the price of a degree. So I thought the Penn degree was very reasonable. And then another thing in conjunction with that, that I kind of mentioned before, the opportunity to be a TLP and to uh, potentially cut that cost in half if I'm uh, getting a, a class tuition waiver every semester was really attractive to me. So uh, those were kind of main things. And then I'll just reiterate what was said before. Um, I expected a rigorous program at UPenn. Um, you know, University of Pennsylvania is not some uh, fly by night or come lately school. It's been around for a long time. It has a very good reputation. You know, it's consistently ranked in the top 10 among universities in the U.S. And so for me, that was a big draw as well that I I could have faith in, and know for sure that the program would be rigorous and really challenge me and really prepare me for the career change that I'm trying to accomplish. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute there. Thank you, Zachary. Um, you bring up really good points about the rigor of our program. And we really pride ourselves in that. We pride ourselves in the support that we offer to help get through a rigorous program as well. Things like the TLP, right? Like you could be working with um, students to help get support to feel successful in these rigorous programs. So thank you for sharing that. I love to hear it. All right. I do have more questions for us. And this is for Ivy and Zach, maybe everyone as well, actually. I might include you in here, Quan. Um, so speaking of that support that we've been mentioning, and I talked a little bit about in my slides as well, and that we've been hinting at in all of your answers, what are some of the student resources um, that you have used to keep you on track for success? Um, 
Juan, I'm going to have you go first again, if that's all right. I think I'm going to have you answer this one, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I think besides, I think you touched on this, Tracy, but um, besides like the, the course content itself, there are like uh, office hours that you can go to for extra help. Uh, from TA, there's the professor office hour. Um, there's also Slack that students can get pretty um, just passionate about sharing their experiences in the previous courses. We also have a website where as a student built um, that aggregates a lot of the course reviews. So reading these reviews really helped me kind of preparing myself or getting the knowledge needed before taking a certain course. Um, and then whenever I need help or I have any questions, um, again, going back to Slack and uh, or even Discord, which is um, several other students use as well. Um, I, I will know that whatever questions I shared, either to staff or other students about a certain course that uh, someone will answer and help me resolve that. Thanks. Yeah, you mentioned, I think an important point where it's, we have all of this staff support where we wanna help our students um, any way that we can in their courses, but other students also wanna help students. Peers wanna help their peers. Like I was mentioning before, and like you just mentioned, we have that like student Slack workspace or we have ed discussion. We have a lot of these places where you can go in and be like, I'm taking this class. I'm really curious what others thought about it. I work full time. What happens if I pair this class with this class? Would that be too much for the semester while I'm working full time? And like I mentioned earlier, you will get responses. It is it is not dry in that slack. It is extremely active. So when you're looking for that kind of support, you can get it really holistically. Um, and sometimes it's nice to hear from fellow students, which is literally why we're doing this panel today. So I'm happy that you mentioned that. Um, Zachary, I'm gonna come to you next. Um, what student resources do you use, if any, to keep you on track for success? Yeah, um, you know, the, the things that have been mentioned before Slack to talk with my classmates, um, it's especially great if you're, you know, working in a group, you you create that group on there with your group members. And um, that's the main form of communication for me this semester with my um, 596, the algorithms course, we're allowed to work in groups of, of three. So I've got my partners on there and we talk, um, you know, a couple times a week, getting getting problems, sharing solutions, getting our homework together because we can do a, a single submission together. So that's great. Um, ed discussion for uh, asking questions of TAs and uh, to get something a little bit more formal, I guess, from a, a more formal source than just a classmate. And I'll just say that you can do that anonymously. There's a way to post anonymously if you're a little bit shy and don't want to have your name associated with it. And there's also a way to post privately so that you can share a solution or code without worrying about uh, sharing that with the, the entire class and you know uh, violating academic dishonesty rules by, by sharing a solution. So there's two methods of uh, having a discussion with a TA on there and both are great. And then the live professor office hours have been invaluable for me for uh, 592, the discrete mass course, and the algorithms course this semester. Those are very challenging courses, but the professors are more than willing to help and answer your questions. And so attending those live, if you can, is great, or at least viewing the recordings and seeing you know, what other students in the class are, are struggling with or had questions about and benefiting from their asking questions. So those are kind of the main three things that I use. Thanks so much. All three of those are awesome. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop trying to chat in between questions as much, and I'm going to toss it over to you, Ivy, now. Um, what student resources do you use, if any, to keep you on track for success? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do also use, you know, Slack channel, and I also send, like, ad post, ad discussion post to ask for, like, academic questions. And besides that, I also go to, you know, faculty and a TA live office hours, so I found like by going attending live office hours, I can, you know, they can 
by communicating with TA and the faculties, I feel like it's better for me to understand concepts, especially for like challenging courses. And then, you know, uh, besides all the like resources about like courses, I also went to like mock interview sessions offered by the Penn Engineering program. I guess like last year when I was preparing for a tech uh, internship interview, I went to like a behavior question mock interview session offered by one of the staff from Penn Engineering. And then they offer me really good advice on answering and uh, how to answering like a behavior questions. And I also went to like resume uh, writing sessions offered by Emily, I guess. And I also get really good advice from Emily. So I feel like Penn Engineering also offer really good advice, you know, good like support for students who are trying to looking for internships and jobs. So that's also, I feel like people should also take advantage of that. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for mentioning the career services. Yes, um, Emily is one of our career service advisors. She's the associate director of career services that Ivy was mentioning. She's fantastic. We also have another career advisor named Sorry You. Um, they both rock. I love to hear that you took advantage of those opportunities. I also like to take this moment. I know I said I was going to stop trying to chat so much between questions, but I, I will be remiss if I don't say this part. Um, we are mentioning in this panel and in this presentation so many different places to go for support. TAs, TALPs, recitations, office hours, Slack, ed discussion. We're throwing out a lot at you. Where I always like to come in and remind folks is when you are a current student, you will all have an assigned academic advisor. That is the person you can always go to first when you're like, I don't know what I'm doing with my career. And I'll be like the reference library of all of the different support that we have. You can go to Emily with career services, or if you come to me and you're like, I'm really looking for more ways to get involved with the community. I went to that webinar like ages ago, and you mentioned all of these different ways to get involved, and I forget all of them. I'm the reference library of like, okay, you're going to go talk to this person over here, and we can maybe start talking about a TA application. That's something you want to do. Or if you're just struggling in your classes, and you're like, I really need support. I This is a rigorous program. I'm here in my first semester. I'm working full time. I'm learning new coding for the first time. Where do I go for support? I can start from there. Again, reference library of all of the different places that you can go. Um, that is what your assigned academic advisor is for. You will have one. We're here to support you and get you connected with all of these different resources we're mentioning today. So don't feel like you need to remember every single one of these when you're a current student. That's what your advisor is for. So Thank you for mentioning that to remind me to say that piece about advising. All right. I do have another question for folks. Um, this one I'm going to ask to you, Quan, um, which is how do you manage your time with school, work, your job, right? And your personal life. You mentioned that in your introduction a little bit, but how do you manage that time? Yeah, I think this is a challenge that I learned to kind of build around. Uh, at first, it was really tough to you know, kind of work, work full time and take classes. Um, to touch on some of the points that you all mentioned earlier, one of the benefits of the program is this flexibility. So whenever I felt like I was always, I was overwhelmed, there was always an option to take fewer classes or even take a leave of absence if there's a big fam family emergency. And uh, Tracy mentioned this, but there's a lot of students who consider themselves to be a turtle. I am one of them, proud member, and I have semesters where I've taken no class, uh, semesters where I've taken one, right now I'm taking two classes, and having that flexibility really helps. Um, considering that being an online program, there's a lot of uh, kind of self-discipline involved, and having a routine I found has really been helpful for me. So just a bit more context. Uh, right now I will get like two hours of studying in before I work and then two more hours afterwards in addition to studying on the weekend. And, or even on days that I'm busy, I would try to do like at least one or two hours and having a consistent routine really helps. Uh, not only with knowledge retention, but also not falling behind. Because um, as Zach mentioned, the program can be very rigorous. Some courses are really challenging. 
And it's important to not fall behind and having that routine and kind of taking advantage of the flexibility of the program have been really helpful for me. That's really great advice. Thank you for walking us through your time management. I think it's something that folks get used to as you start the program and you get adjusted, you really mm -hmm. find what routine works best for, for you. So I'm happy to hear that you have certainly settled in one. That always makes me happy. Yeah. Which goes right into the next question, which is the advice question for all of you to answer, which is what advice would you give to incoming students? Um, so I'll start with Zachary on this one. What advice would you give to incoming students? Yeah, so, you know, as much prep as you can do before the program will make your transition into the program easier. So I'm really glad that I did a lot of uh gained experience with coding before I came into the program because I think it made 591 a lot easier and it's really helped me in, in 594 as well. And then, you know, I'm, I'm not a big social media user and, you know, but the more you put yourself out there on Slack and in Ed discussion, the more you get back. So making the conscious effort to be involved in the community, um, I think will make the program a lot more satisfying in terms of I'm an online student, but I do feel connected to, to my peers and uh, to my teachers. And then, as I said before, the uh, professor open office hours, if you're struggling, go to those, ask questions, people are there to support you. Don't be afraid that, you know, not everyone in this program is a genius. Everyone is struggling and, and trying to learn it just like you. And so having a question is not something to be ashamed of. Everybody has the questions. You have to have the courage to ask the questions and get the answer and work through the difficulties uh, in order to learn. Incredible advice. Do not be afraid to ask for help and do not be afraid to ask questions. We encourage that culture of asking for help and asking questions here. So I really like to hear that you mentioned that. Ivy, I'm going to come to you next. What advice would you give to incoming students? Uh, like back, I would probably, you know, um, for students with little background in computer science, I would definitely recommend they take some, you know, Python and Java programming courses before the program starts. So people will find a lot easier to catch up and do homework if they have like prior um, programming skills. Because I feel like the two courses I take, the programming courses I take are really helpful for me to do homework um, in courses such as 591 and 594. And then the second advice I'm going to give is probably, I feel like the coursework, the curriculum of the MCIT online program is very practical and it's really useful because I feel like, um, especially like courses um, like 594, which lays the foundation in data structures, I feel like that is a critical component of technical interviews. So my own experience in technical interviews has been positively influenced by the knowledge learned in, in the course of 594 and also 596. So I would suggest student probably to learn, you know, not too fast, slowly, but to learn well, to take advantage of the resources Penn Engineering have and never afraid of asking questions and and go to TA office hours to asking for help. Incredible yeah. advice. Thank you, Ivy. All right. And our again, this is our final question in the interest of time. I'm going to point this question to you now, Quan, of what advice would you give to incoming students? Yeah, one advice I like sharing is uh, putting your mental health first, learning second, and grades last. I'm saying grades last because a lot of students incoming are already pretty talented. I don't doubt you have a problem with passing classes. And like we've all touched on, there is a lot of support involved for students. Um, learning second because I found um, having the mentality of I want to learn versus I just want to get a A or A plus. That's really made this journey a lot more enjoyable, at least for myself. And then I think mental health first, because this is a long game, at least for students like myself. And um, you know, there's a lot of us who have to deal with family matters, 
full-time work and there's a lot on our plates already so just keeping that mentality in mind I think will make us more successful in the long run and just getting most out of the program while having a good time. Incredible advice. I really like the way that you laid that out. And I think just reminds me that I want to share with everyone to reiterate what you say. Um, all of us at Pet Engineering Online, especially us who are help supporting you get through your degree. Um, we all care about you as human beings first and foremost. And we understand that holistically, you are a human being first and foremost, and you have responsibilities. We want to help you when life happens. And that's what our student success team is all about. So thank you for mentioning that. Thank you to all three of you, Zachary, Ivy, Quan. This was an incredible panel. You offered such great insights. You offered such great advice. Um, thank you so much for taking times out of your busy days during school and working and all of these other things and family. So thank you. Um, this is incredibly valuable to the folks who are listening in and we really appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to sign off and throw it back over to Jackie. So all I have to say is one big wow. I mean, you guys were all fabulous, including you, Tracy, with your add-ons. That was great. You all did such a great job. Loved it. Um, really, I, I am sure all of our participants who are watching and listening um, are just floored with, with all of the great advice. And um, really, you guys kind of poured your heart into um, what this program was all about or is all about and your journey through it so far. So it's just, it was great. Um, I certainly learned a lot too, which is, I, I always love how much I learn from these webinars. So thank you to all of you. But I just wanted to share with you before we actually sign off, I do have one last slide. Um, you might end here today, the webinar is going to go off and you realize you have another three or four questions. So where to get those answers. Um, for The first place I would go would be our FAQ database. Go on our website, search that database. There are a ton of questions and answers there. So start there. Um, if not, we love to meet with um, our current applicants. So please sign up for office hours. We have office hours just about every day of the week. And again, like I said, we do love to meet with our applicants. So sign up for office hours. They're in 15 minute um, slots and you can meet with somebody from admissions and you can get your, your questions answered that way. Um, like I mentioned, this is a webinar series. So we've had a webinar every Tuesday during the month of March. Um, next week, we have three members, uh, three alumni who will be on our, our panel, and they'll be talking about not only their experience as MCIT students, but they'll be talking a lot about um, their job search, um, if they were career switchers or if they were enhancing in their own industries and their own career careers, and they'll give you uh, tips and talk about their journey as they transition from MCIT uh, into either enhancing their own careers or um, switching uh, to a new career. So definitely want to check that out next Tuesday. Um, and then lastly, um, would be to email us. We do our best to answer all emails within 24 hours. So you can see our email address there on the screen. So lots of diff different ways to get in touch with you. But the bottom line, um, we want to help you. And um, we want to help to answer your questions. We want to ease your concerns. Um, and we want to help you to get that application submitted. And hopefully for you to have a positive response once it's submitted. So again, thank you to all of our panelists. You were wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your MCIT online journey with us. Tracy, you were great. Thank you so much. And I'm, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day or evening um, wherever you are joining us from. So thanks so much. And hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.